completes all operations of the emergency alert system. All stations may now resume regular programs for expanding its sphere of influence on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy and ruthless conspiracy and ruthless conspiracy, and ruthless conspiracy. And ruthless conspiracy. Alright, so one of the more frightening aspects to the global agenda is the push towards technocracy and rule by algorithms. So let's take a look at a clip of former Google CEO Eric Schmidt talking about an all-knowing AI that will run society. And yes, this is a topic that freaks me out. The important point is humans are not mathematically as precise as we wish that we are. And indeed, human intuition is often wrong. And so one of the concerns that we have, which we state in the book, is that eventually there will be knowledge systems that will govern society, which will be perfectly rational. And because they're so rational, they will not be understandable by the average human because they can't explain themselves. Yeah, I doubt that. The engineers most certainly are going to implement bias within their code, either consciously or subconsciously. Now, let me know if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that it's hard to develop anything without some sort of inherent bias within the code. On top of that, the governments commissioning this project will demand certain restraints and parameters are preserved in order to maintain power. Anyway, let's continue. And Dr. Kissinger points out that in history, one of two things happens in that case. Either you have a revolution in the form of guns against the, the man, if you will, or you have a new religion. And we speculate that one of those two will occur as a result of these extremely large gains in perception from non-animate non uh, intelligences. Ah, uh, yes. The main reason as to why they want to go on a mass gun grab. Okay, let me back up. He says there's two possibilities a revolution with guns or a new religion. So yes, gun control is once again in the news, as I'm sure you've seen the tragedies that occurred over July 4th. However, there is something deeper beneath the surface. And of course, we cannot forget that scientism, their new religion, is essentially already established, the Covidian cult. Yes, it is in full swing, and it is easily transplanted onto a different ideology rooted in this form of scientism. These individuals are primed to be broken by the state. It's a perfect storm encapsulating their pre-existing anxieties and reinforcing their delusions. The stubbornness though, that's what's going to keep them bound for a long, long time. But again, let's continue. So, so the, the thought experiment is that instead of Dr. Fauci, we have an all-knowing uh, computer which basically pronounces important things for health. And it can't explain itself. Now, if that doesn't freak you out, then you are already deeply embedded within the cult. A Fauci-like, all-knowing AI. The thought of that will send a shiver down your spine. When Google's deep mind announced uh, that after just a few hours of training itself uh, to play the game, their AlphaZero program had defeated what was then the world's most powerful chess program, Stockfish 8. Now I'm gonna quote the book. The tactics AlphaZero deployed were unorthodox. It sacrificed pieces human players consider vital, including its queen. And later, a few pages later, you, you raise a really key question. Quote again, what if AI recommended that a commander in chief sacrifice a significant number of citizens or their interests in order to save, according to AI's calculation and valuation, an even greater number. This was the part of the book that electrified me. The thought that AI learns in such a different way from humans that it can contemplate tactics that any human chess player or general would regard as involving too great sacrifice, even if, from an AI point of view, those tactics would be uh, likely to deliver ultimate victory. Tell us a bit about that, because it does get us, if not to kill our robots, then at least to AI giving advice to decision makers that could involve shocking sacrifice in pursuit of ultimate victory. So we've seen this scenario you're describing in movies a few times where the hero is sacrificed uh, because of the good of society. And so you can imagine looking at the way Google, uh, sorry, uh, DeepMind played both uh, Go as well as chess, 
that strategies that are seen as immoral might ultimately deliver victory. Um, we also say in the book, just to take on your point, that it's possible that AI at some level will see realities that humans can't see. The fact that AI could discover moves that humans had not discovered in 2,500 years in a well-established game indicates that it may be, it may just be smarter, but it may also see things that humans will never understand. And that's again, a speculation. So what we say in the book is that we, we really think society needs to put teams together to address these issues. We further say in the book, and Dr. Kissinger, who you obviously know extremely well and are a famous biographer of, believes very strongly that what we're seeing is a new epoch. He argues that there was this age called the age of faith. You can describe that for our listeners, um, which was replaced by the age of reason. Again, you can describe that better than I. Um, that, that was the key change hundreds of years ago that allowed us to get to the point of what we think of as today of human intelligence. He believes, and rewrote in the book, they were entering a new age because of this unintelligible or perhaps un, un, in, ununderstandable capability that AI will have. And that's exactly what will happen. AI will most certainly want to sacrifice a large swath of the human population once all the data used for their overpopulation reports are entered into the algorithm. It will distinctly learn that the prevailing core tenant is overpopulation. And what's the remedy for overpopulation? Depopulation. This is not good. If you remember, stories were coming out a while ago talking about how engineers are inputting critical theory into their AI. Critical theory is all about deconstruction. They chip away at ideological foundations and intentionally create cracks as the only way to change the system is to bring it down and rebuild from the ashes. Well, that's what they believe anyway. But for this exercise, imagine an AI built with an algorithmic notion of deconstructing society. An AI that groups people together based upon superficial characteristics and is coded to disproportionately relegate resources and punishment based upon those characteristics. This is not good. And then again, if you add in the climate ideology coded within, that overpopulation is the leading cause of chaos and that humans themselves are a plague on the planet. Well, what do you think is going to happen? That is not a good combo. Yes, of course, they will build teams around guys like Yuval Harari, which consider people to be useless and worthless, doesn't believe in the soul, and believes we are overpopulated. Again, this is not a good combo. So what is quote unquote technocracy? As explained by Patrick Wood, we've talked about this previously, but technocracy is a movement that got started in the 1930s during the height of the Great Depression, when scientists and engineers got together to solve the nation's economic problems. At the time, it did look like capitalism and free enterprise was going to die. So as a result of that thinking, they decided to invent a new economic system from scratch. They called this system technocracy. It was supposed to be a resource-based economic system. Rather than basing the economic system on pricing mechanisms such as, you know, supply and demand, well, this system was instead supposed to be based on energy resources and social engineering. In a nutshell, under this system, companies would be told what resources they are allowed to use, when and what for, and consumers would be told what to buy. That sounds a lot like the Great Reset, doesn't it? And I quote, They actually proposed to use an energy script instead of money and they wanted to let energy be the determining factor on what was produced, bought, sold, and consumed. However, being engineers and scientists in 1938, when this definition came out, they had capsulized what they viewed as the scientific method and the scientific approach to society. It's important to see that today because we see the same subtleties in the same mindsets, the same thinking process that they had back then. I will contend that this is a very, very dangerous thing. It's a very dangerous thinking process. But here's what they concluded in 1938, and I quote, Technocracy is the science of social engineering, the scientific operation of the entire social mechanism to produce and distribute goods and services to the entire population. First off, you'll see that it's the science of social engineering. That ought to be enough to make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. 
Because who wants to be scientifically engineered by somebody that you do not know, somebody that does not know you, but rather has this idea that they can reform you, they can remake you. But most importantly, you see that the economic aspect they had in mind, the scientific operation of the entire social mechanism, that's all the people in society to produce and distribute goods and services to the entire population. This was an economic system from the get-go, not a political system. And that's what's really, really important to see. The big takeaway here is that technocracy viewed politics and politicians as an unnecessary, irrelevant, and even just a stumbling block to getting down the road with society. They proposed to get rid of all politicians, just dismiss them, dismiss the Senate, the Congress, all the elected officials. They basically wanted to set up an organization chart, like a corporation would have today. Whether you would have a president or you would have vice presidents doing different things, then you have directors over certain departments and so on. And the idea, per se, was that they just wanted to disappear the political system, leaving no citizen representation of government. Of course, that would mean that the constitution is immaterial, because that document defines our political structure. In fact, they openly called on FDR to declare himself dictator, so that he could just implement technocracy. He didn't take him up on it, thank God, but we did get the New Deal instead. By comparison, it is much, much better but still not ideal at all. So anyway, this was the genesis of technocracy and the technocrat. So as explained by Patrick Wood, the technocrats had this crazy idea that they were better than everyone else. This philosophy and mindset can be traced back to Henry de Saint Simon, a French philosopher from around 1800. Saint Simone is considered the father of scientism, social sciences, transhumanism, and technocracy. He said in one of his essays, and I quote, A scientist is a man who foresees. It is because science provides the means to predict that it is useful, and the scientists are superior to all other men. Now, we've talked about this quote previously in a video, but I still stand by my statement. I believe Fauci probably has this quote framed on his office wall. Anyway, this was the mindset of technocrats in the late 1930s, and it's the same exact mindset we see today. In essence, science is used to manipulate society and keep the economic engine running. While technocracy began in the US, the first country to ever implement it was Nazi Germany under Adolf Hitler. However, it's important to realize that technocracy is not Republican or Democrat. It's not Marxist or capitalist. It's not a Nazi philosophy. It's an independent ideology. Now it does have some elements that are comprised of both democratic principles and authoritarian principles, but this is a new and completely different ideology. That is for sure. So, when technocracy first began in the United States, it was a membership organization. At its peak, there were more than 500,000 card-carrying, dues-paying members in the United States and Canada. Incidentally, the head of technocracy in Canada was, any guesses? Yes, that is correct, the grandfather of Elon Musk. What a coincidence. However, it was around the same time that a technocratic organization also got started in Germany. And I quote, As Hitler rose to power, he realized that the technocrats as an organization would be competitive with him becoming a dictator. So Hitler decided to outlaw the technocratic party in Germany. And around the same time, technocracy was actually outlawed in Canada, just for about two years. But still, for a number of reasons, they thought that somehow the two were connected and that technocracy in Canada would be supporting Hitler. It was discovered later by historians that these technocrats, who were banned from meeting, were actually very active during the course of World War II, during Hitler's reign. They were the statisticians, the mathematicians, the physicists, the engineers for business, and so on. And that really enabled Hitler's expansion and dictatorship. Now, that's not to say that they were all in lockstep with his goals, but they had a good time supporting all of those things because they were highly prized by Hitler and his leadership. During the war, they found out also that these technocrats were communicating between columns of power in Nazi Germany. Hitler was rather paranoid about keeping all those different areas separate so they would not communicate. But they did, in fact, communicate during the war. 
After the war, however, a top secret operation took place in the US called Operation Paperclip, which brought at least 1200 of these top scientists and engineers from Germany to the United States. They sanitized their resumes and installed them in positions of scientific prowess in the US, such as the National Technology Agencies. So the very same people that were helping Hitler do what he did completely bypassed the Nuremberg trial. Some of them should have been there, I'm sure. But they were brought here to the US and given high positions of prestige to continue the practice of science and engineering. Okay, so the Trilateral Commission's co-founder Brzezinski, a Columbia University professor, brought the concept of technocracy into the commission in 1973, with of course the financial support of David Rockefeller. And I quote, Brzezinski wrote this book called Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technocratic Era, and it caught Rockefeller's eye. And so, Rockefeller and Brzezinski became like Beauty and the Beast. They went to form the Trilateral Commission, which declared from day one that they wanted to foster a new international economic order. This became known as the Liberal World Order, which you may have heard very, very recently. The Trilateral Commission more or less took over the Jimmy Carter administration and has dominated the political structure ever since. And this is regardless of their party affiliations. US presidents have been members of the Trilateral Commission. Carter, Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and Bill Clinton. Yes, they were all members. Within two weeks of his inauguration, Barack Obama appointed 11 Trilateral Commission members to top-level positions in his administration equivalent to 12% of the commission's entire U.S. membership. The ramifications of this, as described by Patrick Wood, are, and I quote, What happened here is that they were after the mechanism, because America was the greatest economic engine in the world at the time. They wanted to get control of the economic engine of the world, so that they could manipulate it for their own benefit and convert it, transform it, if you will, into technocracy. Initially, science is used to issue suggestions, but those suggestions rapidly turn into mandates. We've repeatedly seen that with the current medical predicament, for example. But that medical predicament has also revealed that there's a much larger plan that includes implantable digital identifications, medical records and vaccine passports, digital currency and banking, all of which will ultimately be tied together so that algorithms and automation will be able to keep everyone in line, everywhere, all the time. And I quote, Individuals who buck the system will not be able to participate in society. The algorithm will control everybody. It will manipulate everyone. So it goes from science says to the algorithm. And then it becomes automated. This business of infrastructure is very sophisticated. Today it's called the supply chain. And that's a term you are going to hear again and again. You know, moving goods and services to the right place at the right time. However, with technocracy, their vision is a little different, and I quote, No warehouse is necessary. Just kind of ship it, and it's there exactly the day you need it. This has all been automated as well. It's a part of the infrastructure that they need to implement technocracy from day one. In this book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, the author exposes the stunning capacities currently available to surveil, analyze, and manipulate our behavior. It is very crucial to realize that as bad as everything is today, the predictive power of technology is advancing at an exponential rate, which means their ability to manipulate behavior is increasing at a pace we cannot fully comprehend. And I quote, Data is the new oil of the 21st century. We said that for years now, and it's really true. Whoever owns the data controls the system, Data is more valuable to technocracy than any other commodity, and Google has been collecting this data for a very, very long time. And they have been analyzing this data for equally as long. They have a number of techniques now where they can use that data, weaponize it, turn it back on us, and cause us to modify our behavior. And this is right in line with the scientific social engineering concept. Several years ago, Eric Schmidt, former longtime Google CEO and the man in the clip we watched at the beginning of the video, was invited to become a member of the Trilateral Commission. He's also hobnobbing with our government to create systems for surveillance and data collection. Google now has been in a position to weaponize that data 
and the company does this in several ways. Not only do they condition the feed that you see when you search for a certain term, but also, when you start to type in a search, it will give you the answers and you can pick one. It won't give you the ones that you might really be looking for, but it will give you what they think you should pick. This has a huge psychological impact on people. Google has the power to present information that it wants you to hear or see. And through this, they can manipulate minds and mindsets. It's just amazing. They even said internally that they believe they have the power to take the 2020 election away from Trump because of this very feature. Well, wait a second. It kind of seems like they did help with that. If any person or organization sets themselves up intentionally to overthrow the government of the US, I think there's a term for that. It might be called... Mm, sedition. It might give way to insurrection as well. But that doesn't seem to bother these people. There's no ethical guide whatsoever that tells them this is wrong and do not do it. They feel this is perfectly normal. They've got the data. They make the rules. So they are in fact influencing people. They're nudging people in one direction or another. And it's extremely dangerous because those who are susceptible to that kind of manipulation, once they are in that manipulation channel, they can get them to do anything they want. Once it gets a hold of a person and really starts messing with their mind, then they can feed all kinds of stuff into it and get them to do all kinds of things they would not have otherwise done. And that's true for Facebook and Twitter and all other entities like that as well. However, I don't believe you can look at Google, Facebook, or Twitter and say that these are communists. Now it may have a few facets of communism and fascism and authoritarianism, but in reality, they are technocrats. They march to a different tune completely and they could care less about any of the political ideologies behind it. We are in really, really dangerous times. However, once again, this is Helio Wave. If you like the content, like, comment, and subscribe. Share the video if you want to. If you're in a position to, consider subscribing on Locals or Subscribestar. But as always, make sure you disobey those true fascistas and yes, of course, the technocrats. However, until next time, I do hope you have a good night.